Okay, well, thanks for coming. Um, I hope I'm uh, going to get a chance to share with you some of the, um, the learnings uh, and some of the technology challenges that we found in making IoT data uh, more valuable by sharing it. Um, I'm going to try and uh, cover three areas that we, we think are important. Uh, one is we've found there's more value in the data when it's being shared um, rather than being just used by a single recipient. The second one, we're going to talk about why um, APIs matter and why um, every application needs to have a very strong uh, API strategy. And the third one is why a one-size-fits-all API strategy is not going to work um, for uh, IoT data. Uh, so just a little bit about myself. Um, I've uh, been 20 years in the enterprise software application space. Uh, working with a lot of large corporates, banks, insurance, telecoms, um, utilities, uh, and real estate primarily. Um, Microshare is my second startup. We sold uh, our last company to Accenture um, about seven years ago. Um, and my co-founders and myself have known each other for 20 years. Um, we've worked uh, successfully in a number of very large projects uh, for, for big enterprise. Um, just where we are in the um, LoRaWAN ecosystem, uh, we've really much identified a gap in the market um, between the network server and the applications that use that data. Um, we've seen a lot of people plug directly and create a, a direct relationship between the data and the, and the application, and in that way losing the opportunity to enrich that data before uh, making it available. And when we think about the data consumers, you want to think about visualization tools, whether it's you know, something like My Device from Cayenne, whether it's the IBM Watson tools that allow you to um, mine that data and, and feed artificial intelligence for uh, predictive um, dialing, um, or just platform as a service that a lot of people are adopting, like the um, uh, Amazon Web Services uh, IoT stack or the Microsoft Azure. So we've basically found ourselves um, becoming a, a middleware between the network server layers, whether we've worked with a number of the um, leading network servers, such as Actility, um, Curlink, Loriot, uh, OBWise, and, and TrackNet. Um, we've also had some inf experience integrating directly um, into the um, public operators' um, networks as well, uh, the MachineQ, Comcast, uh, 11X in Canada, Object News and, and Orange in, uh, in front. Um, and our whole platform is really a, an API tunnel, if you will. You know, we've got data coming in from the, um, from the network server uh, in the form of API, and we have all those various consumers and all the various parties coming to request the data through, through API um, at the other end. So our, our whole engineering team is very much uh, speaking uh, REST um, uh, fluently, and that's, that's the entire um, uh, language we've built. Okay, so take a little bit of step back, um, and we believe that um, IoT has a lot of similarities to the way the internet um, grew and became more valuable. Um, we actually written a white paper recently where we compare the uh, the rise of um, TCP/IP and HTML as the kind of the two key technologies that made us you know, use and rely on the internet so much for our day-to-day -day life and create so much value um, in the last 20 years. Um, TCP IP had been around for quite a while and was a mechanism to exchange data. But it wasn't really until HTML came to, together and kind of allowed us to make that data rendered in different ways and linking it uh, between uh, different uh, areas that you started really seeing uh, the rise of the, of the Amazons and, um, uh, and, and then the big new players in, in that field. Um, if you go back 20 years, your bank website would not be speaking to your insurance website and wouldn't be speaking to the delivery companies or, or the product manufacturers. The, everyone was so worried about security, they, they thought on the internet you had to lock everything down the way they had done with their corporate data um, in the past. 
Um, I remember in 99, 2000, um, sitting in the front of the board of Shell Gas, where, where I was working at the time, um, and actually convincing them that it was a time that we would just put you know, the URL of the company on every single document that we were sending out. And we had people fighting because they were scared that this would actually take some, some of the customer contacts we had uh, through the call centers or, or, or other engagements. Um, so we've gone a long way from, from, from that. And I think that one of the reasons why is that on the internet, new entrants came in who actually didn't care about keeping everything in. Their whole business model was around sharing data and making it more useful by adding context to it and in real time, gathering multiple pieces of information from different partners uh, and making them relevant to the person. Um, suddenly, your bank and your insurance company and your delivery services and your product suppliers are all interconnected, giving you the experience that you're looking for without you even having to do a single thing. Um, and it's happening in real time based on your profile, based on your, your history, your social media post. Um, the sort of one-to-one -one marketing that used to be a bit of a hype and, and, and a dream back in sort of the 2000s is, is real today. Um, and, and I think we're seeing a, a similar trend that's going to happen with, with IoT data. Um, so let's take a, a concrete example with uh, you know, the, the Earth's largest store uh, and, and, and a company that you know, didn't exist 20 years ago uh, and is now worth more than, than Walmart, uh, I think about twice actually. Um, so you think about your typical um, experience on, on, on Amazon, you think you're going there to buy a product. Okay, I need a new washing machine, and based on my profile and what I've bought, you know, what I've bought in the past, what I'm searching for, it's going to offer me something that, that looks like what I'm looking for. Great. And obviously, Amazon is a retailer. They're here to sell me a product and a, a physical appliance that I'm going to, you know, get at my house and, and install. Well, once you start looking a little bit more details, there's a lot going on there in that one transaction. So if we start zooming in, I thought I was buying a washing machine, but actually there's financial services products here. They're selling me a store card, the 0% financial transaction. They're offering me an extended warranty, which that's an insurance product. I, I thought I was buying a product. Um, there's a whole mechanism t allowing me to receive that product regardless of where I am in the world. They've actually taken away the whole complexity of import exports, of shipping, they're giving me lots of different options based on my preferred carrier or the cost I want to pay. Again, these are information that they don't have themselves. They're just pulling that in real time from the various suppliers that are offering that, uh, that service. And then keep going. I've got now all sorts of convenience services. So they're going to not just give me the product, but they're going to give me a service to allow it to be operational straight away. That's another upsell. They're going to offer me additional convenience through IoT, actually, with their dash buttons, where maybe I'm going to be able to just order the supplies for that, that appliance without even having to you know, go, go, go online, just press the button, and the stuff shows up. So you think about this one, and this one example, I started out looking for a product, but you can see that the scope and the value that's been created by Amazon, because they've been contextually able to pull in real time various services that I might be interested in, has created a whole array of upsell opportunities for them. Whether it's shipping, whether it's financial services, whether it's your convenience, they've used that real time mashup of data from their partners as well as from my profile to uh, basically create a lot more value than they would get from just selling me uh, this, this washing machine. So our, our theory, and, and, and there's a lot of literature out there, is that on the IoT side, we're going to see a very similar evolution where we are currently at the sort of baby stage. We are in the bank website kind of stage where I'm going in to check my transaction online, and then I'm go going to go and look at another website for my insurance products, and, and then and so forth. We are building right now applications to serve one single purpose, one first receiver of the information, but there's a lot more value to be created if that IoT data we're gathering can be made available to multiple parties. Um, but of course, in, in order to do that, we've got to be able to do that real-time sharing uh, and real-time mashups of, uh, of the information. 
So there's one magic word, one magic acronym to be able to do that, and that's API. Um, that's very much become the universal lingua franca for every single information that's being shared, both on the internet and, and clearly uh, in the IoT world. The, uh, if you look at the, the growth curve of, of APIs uh, over the last five years, it's just staggering. Um, there's no way that today a developer would create an integration point from one company to another without first thinking about, you know, is there any API available? What can I reuse? Um, how can I just make it easy for that information not to be accessible just to me, but to, to other people? Um, so if you have a product or a service that you need to integrate, if you're the insurance company that sells the extended warranty or the, uh, the delivery company, you've got to give Amazon that API. Otherwise, you won't even be even part of that transaction. Unfortunately, a mistake we're seeing a lot of people do that are just starting in that, that world is thinking that it's a one-size-fits-all. I'm going to publish my data through one API, and everyone's going to come and use it the same way. Um, and that's a huge mistake. Um, it means that either you're going to uh, upset the developers um, because you're kind of forcing them down a, a one track, and you're kind of making them consume all sorts of information that they don't really want or need, um, or you're going to create a huge performance issue. Um, and we're going to go delve into that a little bit more. And of course, that has a big impact because you're going to spend a lot of money and time fixing that, that performance issue. And you're going to spend even more time and money trying to repair the damage that, that your reputation may have suffered um, by not having the right thing in the right place. Um, so those of you who have been in the, the Alliance for, for a while may recognize this slide. It's, it's not one of mine. It's, uh, it's the way that, you know, as an ecosystem, we've, um, we've described what we do. So I'm going from left to right. I've got a bunch of sensors that are generating data. And that data is getting picked up by a gateway that obviously makes sure that it's, it's, uh, it's correct and it's, it's, uh, it's available and so forth, pushes it to a network server, which then um, makes it available for, for an application of a server to actually start uh, utilizing. If we drill down into what that application server does, essentially there's four things that are going on. The first thing the application server needs to do is store that data in the right, in the right format. And that typically means you've got to have a big, a big data, no SQL type uh, technology, because we don't know what that payload is. Um, it may be very different, very um, uh, you know, uh, diverse kind of nature, depending on the type of sensor. So you can't sort of use a traditional uh, SQL database. And that's the first issue for a lot of our, uh, our clients. They just, this is a new world for them, the whole um, uh, no SQL database. The second thing you're going to do is unpack that information, make it actually human and, and machine readable. I'm going from a, a byte payload to a temperature or a, you know, or, or, or a, um, a flag for, for open do door closed. And then the final thing, of course, is I'm going to ut utilize that data, make it you know, available to applications and to people, whilst, of course, doing all of that in a, in a very secure manner. So all those steps are, are expected to happen pretty much instantly. Um, and require a lot of big data technologies that most people are, are just uh, starting to understand um, and are still very new. Most of the organizations in the end customers of, of, I of IoT don't have that, that experience. Um, so we got to help them a lot. And that's making it a lot more difficult when we start zooming down on what utilizing data means. Um, there's a lot of different ways that people are going to want to use that, that and, and, and consume that information. And uh, you're going to have to think about the performance and, and the, the kind of architecture impact for that. Um, so we've kind of categorized kind of our, our top six of, of the way that we see people uh, want to, to utilize data. Um, there's, probably a, there's probably some more out there. Um, from our experience over the last four years, we feel that's a, a reasonably comprehensive uh, set of, 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 um, uh, of scenarios. So the first one is real-time display. I just want to see my data in a dashboard. And that's the kind of the most obvious. That's the first one that people think about when, when, when they put a, an IoT data. The second one is I'm looking for a specific pattern or a specific uh, a, a trigger that's going to mean I maybe I send an alert or a notifi notification. And that's a different, obviously, uh, use of the, of the information. The third one is I just want to know what's going on. You know, I want to see where things are. I want to see you know, what temperature across, uh, across an estate. But I'm only interested in now. I don't need to know what went on last year or, or last week. 
Um, the fourth type is I'm trying to do some analysis. It's kind of the equivalent of the, I, I want to run a, a SQL query in the old world. Uh, you know, I want to send a, a, a specific number of parameters and, and get, uh, you know, get a response. The fifth one, real-time mashup, is bringing us closer to the whole Amazon example. I want to kind of not just look at one set of sensor information, but I actually want to blend different sources, both maybe sensors and uh, information coming in from my ERP or my CRM system, and do that again in real time to make um, that information uh, available to, to myself or my, my business partners. And then the final one is I, I'm really kind of trying to get a whole set of historical data. Kind of think about it as a, the equivalent of a, of a batch uh, export. I'm, I need to go and get a big piece of information because maybe I have a, a new business partner that I want to uh, share that data with, or I'm starting a, a machine learning initiative um, that I'd like to, uh, to be able to uh, get a, a big historical view on. So if we just quickly zoom on, on, on each of those. Um, the first one is uh, sharing data on a dashboard. And that's basically, again, the real time. That's the first thing that most people uh, want to have. And that's really focusing typically on the current period and trying to see with the variations that are, that are happening. It's usually, you know, it's got a lot, a lot of interesting value because it helps us as human. Um, most of the IoT data that we consume is completely new. It's stuff that we never had before. So it's actually a great way for us to kind of realize that that data is real. It exists. but I I believe that in the long run, that's actually going to be one of the most useless uh, because we're just going to have so much of it that we won't be able to consume it. So we will need to start thinking of different ways to, uh, uh, to, to leverage the information. But we need one API that's able to just do that, the feed, feed the dashboards, um, whether it's you know, going into a, uh, you know, a business object or, or a tableau to kind of make pretty graphs. Next useful thing we're going to do with that data is in real time, start searching for uh, detecting patterns or thresholds that mean an event. So in, in healthcare, for instance, you know, if I have someone who I'm, I'm monitoring and I'm realizing that for a number of hours they're not moved, I need to, to go and tell someone. That's a, an event-based, and you're going to have a number of applications that are subscribing to that information. They don't want to see the, every single um, piece of sensor information. They want to know if something is happening. And so you're going to have that sort of publish, subscribe type relationship uh, in, that, uh, in that event. Um, and that's also going to fit typically your sort of machine learning predictive uh, type scenarios where you're trying to kind of pick up in pieces of information that are leading factors to tell you, hey, this machine is likely to break down in the next five hours. Let's go and send someone now. So that's a different API, of course. Um, now you think about some of the, the new things that are happening in LoRa 1, we're getting very good at geolocation. Well, geolocation is one of those things where there's a lot of use cases for it where I really want to know where my stuff is now. I don't care where it was last week. I want to see it on a, on, a, on a map and sort of figure out what is going on at this point in time. So again, I need to be able to just in real time get maybe the last location or maybe the, f the last five locations because I'm trying to marry that with maybe traffic information to kind of predict where that, um, that vehicle is going to be in the, next, uh, in the next five minutes or uh, when it's likely to arrive. So again, that's another type of, of, of API and consumer of that, of that information. Um, the next one is I'm looking for a specific uh, criteria. I'm trying to understand, um, you know, what's going on with a part of the information. Uh, and so for that, it's really kind of the equivalent of a, of a structured query uh, in, in, the, in the old world. And we're going to have to allow the application. We don't know what the application is going to request for. So again, we got to give them some parameters that they can utilize to then go and query um, the, the IoT data. Um, and so in that instance, because the, the data is not structured, we've got to be able to um, allow the, inf the uh, application to have access to pretty much the whole information and then sort of uh, break it down to the pieces that they're, they're, they're looking for. So again, that's a, that's a fourth API that we gotta, we got to have in our arsenal. The fifth one is one of the more interesting ones, and that's getting us very much closer to the, the Amazon example I had earlier where I'm mashing up in real time different sources of, uh, of information and um, I've got to do that at, uh, you know, at scale and, and bring them together. 
at the same time, I want to make sure that I don't create a, you know, a huge performance uh, hog on my, on my network, on my, on my servers. Um, so we've got to do that in a, in a way that, uh, uh, you know, that is going to make sense. Uh, and then the final thing is there's, there's times when you get an audit and someone asks you to see the entire records of something that you have or you've got a new business relationship. And again, to kick start off, you, you, you need to export an entire data set. Um, and, and, and given the size of what we're dealing with, uh, this is not going to be trivial. So again, something that you've got, you've got a plan for. Um, to, if you're starting a machine learning initiative, you, again, you're going to want to give that, uh, that uh, initial kickstart of, of data um, that's going to give the, um, uh, the, the tool set um, the initial uh, load of, uh, of information that, that, that it needs to start detecting patterns. And then obviously you switch to another type of, of relationship once that uh, system is in place. Okay, so um, what's the right tool set to, to do all of those things together? <laughs> there's lots of, there's lots of you know, existing uh, big data tools out there. What's, how are you going to choose the right one for, for your IoT data mashups? Uh, the answer is there's none of them right now that out of the box give you everything that we just talked about. Um, and that's one of the challenges that we've been grappling with um, over the last four years. We've, we're actually on the third um, rewrite uh, of, of our platform. We hope this is a good one um, at this stage because we've, we've, we've now seen enough scenarios, I think, that um, we've basically taken the best of some of those tools that are out there. Um, we say typically, you know, people ask what our platform stack is. It's about 80% open source, and it's about 20%. You know, probably 15% of it is kind of picking the right parts of each of each tool, and then 5% is secret is our, our real secret source. Um, there's you know a, a lot of really good tools that we can leverage from that have been contributed by the, the Facebooks and the Twitters of this world because they've really had to deal with this sort of massive information load uh, and kind of real time uh, element. But of course, they've been dealing with primarily human generated data. Um, so adapting those tools for machine generated data, which is what we deal with with, uh, with IoT, um, is quite a, bit, quite a bit of a task. Um, so we, we, we hope that we've uh, built enough now to start you know, giving some of that back um, and kind of build really a standard for um, making data, data available for, for multiple parties. Um, so just a quick recap. Um, we think that um, IoT data, like, um, like data that we use on the internet, has a, a lot of potential to, to be multiplied in value and create brand new uh, revenue sources for, uh, for, for, for clients by being shared and by being partially utilized across multiple, um, multiple parties. To do that, we've got to keep embracing and kind of really hone in on standardizing APIs that facilitate those data exchanges, uh, make it easy for people to consume information, make it easy to comply with regulations, um, and to you know, get paid for, for sharing that information. Um, and the final thing is, given the variety of ways that people are going to want to consume that data, there isn't a single uh, tool set, uh, there's not a single API, one size fits all, that's going to work.